So we're here on James Hanley's farm in Horse and Jockey, and we're presenting a panel on EBI delivering for farmers in Ireland. George, what I, I'd, I'd really like to start, start with you. You have a lot of experience. You've looked at EBI over the last 20 years. We've moved from that old system of RBI. What has EBI delivered for the industry in Ireland? We reckon, Martin, that EBI has delivered about a, mil a billion euro in, in additional profit to dairy farmers over the last 20 odd years. And it's done that through improvements we've seen in milk production or the productivity of our cows and also in terms of fertility, in terms of when they calve and retention of cows on the farm. So there's been substantial gain generated over the last 20 odd years. Okay, and I see, I, I see Owen is nodding to this about, uh, about fertility. I think the key thing for me from looking at it from a veterinary point of view, we struggled a lot with fertility back in the day. And I would certainly add to that, that the, that sub-index in fertility yeah. has driven that piece. Owen, from your own point of view on your farm in, in, in Kilorgan, you've gone on a journey here. Uh, when did your journey with EBI start and what were the elements of it that helped you? Yeah, well, well I suppose we, I, I would have been a young farmer in the, in the early 90s and joined discussion groups okay. and all we used to hear about was the RBI system and what a cow would milk yeah. and it was purely what she'd milk, you see Martin. So um, at the time, holding on to cows in the herd was something I would have been conscious of and also, which wouldn't have been the thing at the time, was taking the Christmas month off, you see, and uh, a lot of farms were milking right through. And these cows in the RBI system were happy enough to do that. So what we wanted to do was try and build a fertile herd. So fertility was a huge thing. And when EBI came out, I could see huge benefits in the fertility <coughs> side of it, in bringing, keeping fertile cows on the farm and breeding the fertile cows. The RBI system never brought that in. So you went from, a, say, a, a, a low calving or a moderate calving rate in spring, <coughs> and now you've got to a point where, uh, wh what's your calving rate like now? So, yeah, I, I guess back then we would have been, we would have been in the mid-90s, we would have been calving from Christmas till June. Okay. You know, and it would have been the norm. Yeah. Um, we had a percentage protein at 3.11 and we had a fat at under 4%. Um, I'd say by the end of the 90s and early 2000s, we would have, within our own herd, not buying stock, we would have had calved every cow before we started breeding, which was a challenge. Um, since then, I suppose, through the induction of better management and picking better bulls, our, mm -hmm. our protein at present is at 370, like we'd be doing over 500 kilos of solids with actually less milk than we okay. would have had back then. So producing less volume, less getting volume. A, a better solids constituent. And Robert, you made a point to me earlier on, you're, you're working as such, I'm going to say you're working on your own, you're calving down 120, 130 cows, am I correct saying that? Yes, yes. And, and that, so, and you've gone on that journey as well. Some, some farmers are really worried when they hear that word compact calving, they get apprehensive about it. How's that work for you? It's hard while it happens, but it eases the rest of the year, like, because you come into the breeding season free of the calving. February, like, is, a, is, is an absolute nightmare month whatever way you go about it. There isn't an easy, there isn't a word, simple is a word I hear used. It doesn't exist in dairy farming as far okay. as I'm concerned. Because like, but once you have it over, then you have the next cycle coming in at least. But imagine having the two together. So, so you have very clear work elements where you say, okay, I've got everything calved. I'm now moving on to grass. I'm now moving on to breeding. Is that your experience as well, Michael? Well, uh, to bring a point in here that you brought, when, uh, 20 years ago I was in college and the farmer of the year, I remember well, had a calving into it of 402 days. Mm -hmm. Now this was a message that rang home to me, but this was just norm in the industry at the time. Mm. And now pretty much all the group here that are involved in farming, we're looking at 365. My own herd now at the moment was 367 last year, it was 366 the year before, so we're holding around 365. Yeah. So that goes with the compact calving. So, EBI has served me well on a fertility point of view. Now we focus way more heavily on it now. I'm way mm -hmm. more educated on it, but naturally it brought us there nearly unknowingly over the last 20 years. Okay, so it's, it, it's, it's sort of a hidden, almost a hidden element to it. And I think you were saying to me, George, that internationally this is, this is viewed very positively. Very, very positive because fertility is, from a sustainability perspective, fertility is so important in terms of retention of animals in the herd, both in terms of survival and in terms of calving interval. Now the content is more in terms of the uh, retention of animals in the herd. So we get more lactations out of the cows that we have, which reduces the carbon footprint of the young stock coming through. Seamus, as a breeding advisor, you come across all types of farms, all types of situations. We're dealing with people who are really operating at the top 10% here. But from the point of view of the general person out there, they're looking at EBI. As I say, we might have a certain amount of apprehension. We're talking about the fertility piece. What have you seen in your travels as regards that fertility piece? people getting used to it. 
Yeah, look, at the, the, the landscape has transformed over the last 10 or 15 years for people who are just even using the fresh semen program. Uh, they don't even have to, in my view, spend a whole lot of time picking bulls or get into a lot of technicals on it. Mm. Um, the, what, what I would say in terms of farmers who are, get, who are new to this and, and maybe should start thinking about using high EBI bulls in the, you know, this season or next season, um, the first thing to, to remember is that fertility, first and foremost, means higher production. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I took even people like us a while to get our heads around that because they're calving earlier and they're staying around longer. So mm -hmm. if you want to produce more kilos of fat and protein, you first must get your fertility right. And I'd say the advantage they have over all these guys mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. when we started off breeding for EBI and high fertility is that the bulls are so much better now. So they can uh, make far bigger leaps much quicker than mm. maybe a lot, of, a lot of guys around the, the panel here today. So to me, this is not only achievable, it's achievable at a very fast rate. Yeah, I, I, I think that's really mm. important because I think, and again, we've had that chat, George, is if we have a herd now that is a sub 100 in EBI and we have that reluctance or we've had a tradition and we're worried about milk volume and so yeah. on, what sort of time frame are we looking at to flip that herd? And what's, What's, what's the best way to do that, do you think? Well, the, the nuclear option for the really low performing herds is the, you sell the herd you have and you buy in high EBI stock. And there's any amount of 200 plus EBI heifers available for the mm. auto, it will transform your herd. We looked at there lately at a herd who had gone from 70 EBI, so literally sold out the herd over a couple of years and bought in effectively a brand new herd. The milk checks for the year for 120 cows were up by 80 grand, 80,000 euro or more. And that was just in terms of milk. Feed costs had gone down. Okay. And retention of those cows, empty rate at the end of the season, was sub 10%. It completely transformed his herd. My, my co-op, which I supply, is dairy goat, right? Yeah. Mm. And when I look at the milk price that I get versus the average, and I'm not talking about the bottom yeah. 10%, mm. we get two and a half to three cents a litre more than the average. Now, if you're supplying a million litres, which is quite possible, yeah. that's mm. 30,000 euros. That for the same man or woman that's milking the cows, feeding them, I can get that much more than they're getting. I can pay somebody to make my life easier for my yep. family, for myself, for my hobbies, whatever I want to do. Uh, sorry, so, sorry, and there's a real strong <laughs> message, Michael, is that, is that we're, we're looking at the pounds, shillings and pence in that mill price. It, is, that, is that the point you're, you're it, going for? It on? was from the other side. George mentioned retention. Mm. So if you look at the retention of the animal, it, it's costing, now these were the figures before the inflation of everything that has happened the last yeah. number of months. It was costing 1,540 euro to get a heifer into the milking parlour, yeah. to bring that heifer in. Sure. And she's going to be three quarters of her way through her second lactation before she's paid back to you. So mm. if she doesn't calve down on your farm as a third calver, you've mm. lost money in actually bringing her in. She's cost you money. So the retention of cows, and, and Michael is dead right in what he said about milk price, and milk price will increase you on the EBI, but the actual fertility of keeping them animals in your herd longer, okay. the money is huge, and it's a hidden cost inside in every farm if you have a high replacement rate. That 1,540, and it's probably a lot higher now, I, I don't know what the figure is, but it's a huge figure on farms if you have a plus 20% replacement rate every year. But and Martin, this is fitting into our sustainability message, George, yeah. is that right? Martin, when we look at the, the national average herd versus the next generation herd in the Kilworth farm mm. at Moor Park, 56% of the <coughs> next generation herd calve for the fifth time. That mm. figure is 35% for the national average. Okay, so, so we got a longer lived cow, we got better constituents, we got better value out of that constituent production. Yeah and that high fertility is driving our days in milk at grass. That, that, uh, that's kind of where we are. And it's giving you a greater choice, Matt. The sustainability of that cow hanging around is giving you greater choice when you look at whatever aspect, milk cordon or whatever you want to do to improve your herd. Okay, and, and I might get to that a little bit because often we talk about all the time selection of bulls, selection of bulls. Talking to all of you this morning, it's really interesting about your selection of cows. So what cows to breed from? Robert, in your experience, you're doing all AI. You've looked at your herd growing and, uh, growing and developing. <coughs> Have you some rules? That what cows are you not going to breed replacements from? Absolutely. I am not breeding from temperamental cows. For they're the first thing I will not touch. Second thing is feed. Any cow with feed problem now, she might be bred, but she'll be bred to a beef bull. Okay. She's not coming back. She's not going through the herd. Cell count. If the history is there, it, it, she might be her fault or whatever, but I am not breeding a heifer from her if she has that problem in her. And it seems to like it seems to be correct, and like over the time I've been doing it, it seems to be correcting itself. My cell count is in control. 
Yeah, so you're so. constantly looking for that healthier, long-lived cow. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I think in your case, and I know you've been a very strong advocate of milk recording and looking at the detail in there. What is there is there criteria you use within that selection? A mother will breed a, a daughter that usually has a high cell count. There's a huge correlation there are feed problems. You know, so that's just facts and you can do all you like with all the breeding that you want to do. But a daughter will, once again, if she's got mm. like a, a, a problem with a sphinx or whatever it is, that genetics will follow on. So like that's an opportunity there for you not to breed that problem into your herd. Okay. So, so okay. there's no, it's foolish to go along and put that animal in calf to a replacement down the road where you're going to oh, well, a keep her or not keep her. So you have an opportunity there to put a beef bull on her and keep away. Okay, I look at it fairly carefully. Somatic cell count is the first thing. When the first thing comes in the door, that's what you're trying to manage. Any cow that has a somatic cell count <coughs> point of problem, you'll go along. And if it's not, obviously, like we say, when you, for, mm -hmm. if it's a chronic case, you might, you'll CMT. You lose a paddle to figure out what to do with her. So like, and uh, that's why the milk recording is really important to me. And from a breeding pr perspective, which we're here today, mm. I, if I have an animal with a high somatic cell count, I will not breed off her. I do not want to replace them off her, so okay. I'll put a beef bull in her straight away. And like the milk recording report is designed in such a way now that you have a herd index on the side, and you can use it that way if you're not into really in-depth analysis, which I probably am, but if you're not, if it, it, it's, it's, um, you have a herd rank from one to whatever you have. So you can rank your cow, pick your bottom 20 yeah. and, and take them out. Have you some criteria on that you use bef uh, before you start into your breeding cycle with cows? Yeah, it'd be very similar to the lads, um, uh, particularly Robert. We, we would pick um, certainly cows with, with, with feet, temperament and others. Now on the cell count one, what we generally find a, a problematic cow for cells mm. is, is either a free milker or she, it's a teeth problem she will have. Okay. So we would eliminate them. Um, and cells wouldn't be an issue. Um, we'd eliminate them. I suppose on, on the other side of it then, what we'd be doing for looking is the selection of the bulls. And in the selection of the bulls, uh, we'd be very particular that we're not breeding off too much off one sire. So what we do when we're picking our sires, and it, it's quite simple, and it'll keep your herd very uniform, is we never <coughs> pick more than two genomic bulls off one sire. Numbers in your head maybe, George, around uh, sort of minimum EBI we're looking for replacements from, and maybe when they calve, uh, how does that influence cow choice there as well in terms of replacements? So, so look, as a rough rule of thumb, and kind of on a national basis, Martin, we're talking maybe a threshold of around 150 EBI in the cows. So if they're mm -hmm. sub-150, maybe the, the beef root might be the better option for them because we're trying to accelerate genetic improvement. The genetic improvement we're making is fantastic, but let's make it greater. Let's have a, a, a more rapid increase. So sub-150 as a kind of a threshold beef, above 150 EBI, all other things being equal, calving date, mastitis, legs and all that being good, mm. we're, we're going to dairy them. And we want them calved early as well, so they need so to be calved in the first cows. three or four weeks. Okay, yeah. so generally, I suppose as a rule, if, she, if, she, if she's not calved by Paddy's Day, we're not looking for a heifer even sooner than that? I would say would the first, preferably the first of March. Okay. And remember, your, your heifers are a really great target audience to use for breeding the next generation as well, because they're generally better genetics <coughs> as well. But Martin, is there any logic in, in breeding a replacement that's going to be born outside in the month of February? Oh, absolutely. Like, even absolutely if you look at the New Zealand yeah. blueprint, they would have had, the, put every, okay, the, uh, the first three weeks, is all, is all AI, uh, all Frisian AI, and that's it. And then, like, she's already, she's fertile. She's already coming in the first three weeks. She's already ticking a lot of the boxes. If you want to keep things very, very simple. If you don't want to get into huge selection, if you breed off the ear, if you only put the early cows and calf to Frisian, you've already gone halfway down the track if you don't okay. want to go selective. As a, as a general rule. Yeah, and uh, once you get yeah. your three weeks, like, if you have, even if you have a poor conception rate, even if only 50% of them go on calf and you do the first three weeks, you'll get ample replacements out of that. Like. Absolutely. And, and, and sometimes that's often the issue, Michael, is that, you know, we, 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 because herds are getting so fertile, we can breed replacements quite fast. Uh, your experience, James, in terms of selection, again, is there any rules around cow selection that, uh, that you look at when you're advising? Um, of course, and a lot of it depends on, on the type of farmer you're speaking to. Like, speaking to these guys, you have different conversations, speaking to guys who are new to the, new to the yeah. thing. But what I would say in terms of, there is doubts in some people's minds out there about the benefits of EBI. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that's in some ways healthy because we always need to question what right. we're doing. It's ranked on an A plus B minus C payment system. So it's as accurate a figure as you can get when it comes to ranking bulls on production. Mm. Really good number, the milk sub-index or production sub-index. And the other one is, 33% <coughs> uh, is the fertility sub-index. And as I said earlier on, without fertility you will not get production. So, so I, I don't know any farmer in Ireland who's been paid on an A plus B minus C payment system is not looking for those two traits. 
Okay. So, so, so by just using, for example, in terms of selecting sires, by just using the fresh panel alone, mm. you are going to make serious progress in a short amount of time without go having to go into the, any of the real complications that some of the guys at, at the higher level are at. Okay, so <coughs> if we look at that in general, we're getting onto the sire piece, is that, you know, people say, oh God, we picked these bulls, they're, you know, they're, and the next time a proof comes out that bull falls and all this kind of stuff, and it gets a bit of negative attention. I mean, R Robert, if you're looking at, at picking a team of bulls, and I understand that you're in the you use Gene Ireland program and so on, you might explain your reckoning just, just around teams. Look, uh, on, the, on the point you made, you're going to take hits with the EBI, like there's bulls that do fall off the scale. Mm. But I'll tell you one thing, they don't leave bad cows behind them. That's yeah. the first thing. They're not. They're way higher standard than a stock bull heifer or a bad cow. Tell me your right. really good line, if you remember it well, about your view of that stock bull piece versus the. the well, piece. it's 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 something I, I I said before. I learned it a long time ago. The best stock bull is not as good as the worst AI bull. Okay. And I stick to it as. I, I just couldn't. We're going to nail. Yeah. We're going to nail you to the mast on that one. Well, I'll stand behind it because well, it absolutely. Well, it just. Okay. It just doesn't. You just don't have to think about it. Take. We're all here. We've all put out bull calves being tested this year, right? And they've come back. They haven't made it, right? Mm. So you can imagine the ones that haven't made it that I have seen, right? In my herd, I would take them as decently good calves, right? Okay. Good calves. So you can imagine the ones that have made it, like okay. they have to be better, like so. Any com Michael, yeah, yeah, comments on, on, on I, I, risk it, in here? I do my own, I'm DIY AI, so I could have up to 17 bulls in the tank every year. Now, to explain, it sounds like a lot of bulls, right? Okay. I'll, I'll pick 10 bulls that I want to use, right? Yeah. And then there's seven bulls that I'll get from the Gene Ireland program, right? But every, I'll, the most I'll pick is 10 straws from each bull. Mm. Okay, so I, the reality is with a 66 or 7 or 8% conception rate, I'll only end up with three or four heifers from any bull at most coming into my herd. So she can be a superstar. She can run the 100 meters there in, in 11 seconds. I don't, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But she still would be a really good performer. And even if she has issues with, with temperament or something like that, it's only four heifers. It's not going to break my heart like. But still, I'm spreading the risk across the herd. And the other thing, which was brought up earlier on, it's very important as well that you don't fall in love with any particular sire. You know what I mean? Have a good range of bulls in the tank. Have a good even team. Like you know what I mean? Mm. Have a good range. And also as well, if you're into more into depth, try and avoid bulls bred by the same sire. Like you know, you get every year we get a, a bull that breeds a whole lot of new bulls, right? Uh, young bulls onto the scene. Yeah. Try and only use one or two of them. Spread the risk. Okay, Spread so, it out. so spreading the risk is a message. It's really important. Okay. We, we, we've been fortunate enough. We've been doing it for the last 10 or 12 years out of sheer interest. And it served me well. I never fell in love with any bull because I thought it was a risk, a risk in the overall scheme of things. And it's really served our herd well in the long run that we don't get huge fluctuations now. Because George, who is very good at the figures, when you do the probability on it, yeah. if you use a range of bulls, the probability is very, very small. And you're up Just in the 95%. maybe a little bit for us. I suppose the big, the big thing, Martin, to remember is that on average about a third of the calves born on any individual farm nationally are sired by one bull. And that's, that's too big a risk to spread. So we need to use biggish teams. 100 cows and heifers use about seven bulls. 200 cows and heifers use about 14 bulls. You won't go too far astray. And use them evenly is the other thing. So from the breeding advisor's point of view, is that part of your role? Because some people are not going to have the confidence to go and look at this. They're, this is a big chunk of work that they're not familiar with. Mm. Is that part of your role as a breeding advisor that you can look at this for them? I think it's part of a role as a breeding organization. Okay. Uh, because, and this is why um, the Fresh program is so attractive, because there's, a, there's a 9, 12 bulls in the Fresh program. They're changed every day. There's different pedigrees there, etc. And they're all selected on production sub-index and fertility mm. sub-index. And the, the, farmers, the farmer, unknowns to himself, is using a whole uh, spread of bulls, spreading his risk as he goes through the breeding season, unknowns to himself. So to me, all of this, like these guys are accredited, you know, they're an example to, to any farmer in Ireland, but yes. the an awful lot of guys, have not, I'm not saying they've no interest in it, but they either haven't got the technical expertise or they haven't got the, the time to put into selecting bulls. Absolutely. So yeah. we do it for them, we, do, we, we plan out the, what, fresh, fresh, what bulls are going in the fresh programme and we do all the sire advice for them. And the, sire, the key thing about sire advice, in my view, more than anything else, and I agree with Owen in terms of it's, it's like uh, high production to low production cows, it's nice complementary matings, but the key thing is inbreeding. Yeah. And, and okay. the sire advice will do the inbreeding for you. And, you'll, and I would say to you, with a lot of confidence, 
just do them two things, fresh program, sire advice, and you'll breed a hell of a profitable herd of cows over a few years. Okay. Just, sorry, just to support yeah. what James is saying, the, the only thing then that that farmer has to do is pick out the cows that he doesn't want to put in calf to exactly. AI. Yeah. So when the farmer, okay, when the AI technician yeah. comes into the yard, he spend that two minutes is all he has to do yeah. or she has to do to say, well, that one gets a beef one. No matter how much of a hurry he's in, she gets a beef and that's it. Yeah. Okay. And that's the most okay. important and thing that you do. To the beef. Just on one thing, we'll say for, for the guy that does want to breed his own replacements that hasn't been doing it, yeah. there's two big things that, that both Michael and George have said. One thing Michael has said is hugely important. If you breed your replacements in your first three mm -hmm. to four weeks, mm -hmm. you're automatically breeding your most fertile cow on your farm. Yeah. So that replacement is going to be the most fertile. And if you're a farmer that wants to, we'll say, eliminate whatever each of us have said, that's the bad cow, we'll say, or the cow that has a slight health problem, you eliminate her out. <laughs> now, George mentioned 150 of an EBI cutoff point. <coughs> For a lot of herds, that might be their better cows. Yep. Mm. And there is, there is huge bulls out there for a 150 EBI cow that will improve her. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you're, if you're a herd that's concerned about biosecurity and you don't want to go buying your replacement stock, if you can take out your, 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 your cows, you don't want to breed legs, others, temperament. And if you can breed for the first three to four weeks, you're automatically breeding your most fertile cow yep. and breed her to your high EBI bull, whether it's fresh or whatever, mm -hmm. you mm. will, in a couple of years, make huge gains huge in your herd. Okay. And it, it is to do that. It's, it's, it's not to be tempted. And Michael said about the, the falling in love with a bull. Don't fall in love with a cow in your herd and breed her three or four times yeah, to get I, a heifer off her because yeah. she's not a fertile yeah. cow. Sure. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. But now, yeah, we, we've one important group of animals that we haven't spoken about. It's our heifers. heifers yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. absolute lunacy. The best genetics that you have in mm. your herd are your heifers. Breed, like if you, you, the best animal you're going to get is a heifer out of a heifer. Now, God rest my dad, this was a policy we had. We always went our heifers to the best stock we possibly could. And this is what grew, this is what made exponential leaps for really us. It really speeds it up, Michael. It speeds yeah. the whole thing up. So we're going to go back to the start of the conversation here. If you have compact cabin, You've moved from that. By the time you get to May, when you really have to focus on your heifers to get them in calf, you're no longer rearing calves. You're pretty much, all, all your calves at this stage are either sold or they're, they're reared. You've already moved on to a very important uh, 20 days. Whether you do synchronization, fixed time AI, or you watch them as, the, as they're coming bull and with, with vasectomized bulls, which I highly recommend for heifers. You give them one opportunity to go in calf to AI. They're up to size. You've all the work done before that. There is no reason with heifers that you shouldn't be getting 80% conception rate to heifers if the AI is done correctly. And thankfully, we're getting it every year. And there's no reason why Super. not. Just, just, just a quick a no round. Brand. Breeding heifers, are you sync, vasectomized? How, how, how do you at at home, I'm, synch I'm synchronizing. And I would say in the, uh, the, one of the biggest improvements or developments that's happened over the last three or four years is the success of synchronization program on heifers. Okay. Not, not, and I agree completely with Michael in terms of your breeding and your best genetics, but for me as a farmer, it just takes all the, 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 the pain in the ass workload out of getting heifers in and out to the item. And in the next panel, we'll kind of explore yeah. synchronization and so on. Yourself, Robert, what's your system with your heifers? I just serve them as they come. They're, they, they, I bring them home to the yard to the yard, and they stay at home for the three weeks. Then I have teaser bulls with them, and I still AI them through mm. like, to the finish because okay. I don't have a bull on the farm. Michael? It might sound very workload, but I, I actually AI them uh, natural service for 20 days. They're, no, they're on an out farm, right? So I have two <laughs> bulls with them with, with uh, chin balls on them, two, two vasectomized well, yeah, balls, balls yeah, right, with chin yeah. balls on them, two different colours. Trust me, when they're bullying, you spot them from Mars, like, you know what I mean? We only go to see okay, them. You, you know, you only see yeah, them. I only service. see them once a day at 10 o'clock in the day by the time we've all the work done. We get up there at 10 o'clock and it takes me maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Well, the reality is that's 30 hours over the year. Mm. Mm. Like, yeah, that's well all it is for 20 days. It, it, it pays me back multifold. And it okay. makes no, and, and that's why also as well, the other trick of the trade is with the vasectomized bulls, let them off two or three weeks before the breeding season starts. Don't let them off the day you're starting, because everything will be bull. Mm. You yeah, understand yeah, what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, get them relaxed, yeah, get them yeah, settled get down, settled put the chin balls on them the day before you start. And it's simple to pick them up bull. It's no, okay. You'll have no okay. problem whatsoever. It's oh, very yeah, we're, we're ver for you. very similar. We, we do go one step further, as in we, we put the scratch cards on the heifers. <laughs> we put the, the spray on glue scratch card on the heifer three weeks beforehand. Mm. So when we go to see them every day, we just like, write them down in the notebook. When we start breeding, we don't need to have all the heifers in the one bunch. Gotcha. So the first 10 that we're bulling, we'll put with the vasectomized bull. And the one trick we do, and we find it hugely helpful, the day she's served, we don't put her back with them again. 
she goes to a different paddock. So your, your vasectomized bull is only with the heifers that are coming in bullying. So the day she is served, she's moved to a different paddock. Okay, and that way- How many groups have you got then? So um, we, yeah. we, we, we would only have, we, we could bring half them home or we could bring them all yeah. home, it doesn't matter. But what we do then is, the most important thing is the day she's served, move her somewhere else. Okay. Because when you're going okay. to a paddock the following day, you're only looking at a vasectomized bull with a marked heifer. So she's not, she's not the, the one that was done yeah. the day before, the day before is gone. So so just, something, just something I, just I do at the end now, in, yeah. when you have the, we'll say the middle of the heifers, we'll say 15 or 20 of them gone, I'll put them with the cows, mm. with the milking cows. Remaining just no, put, them, put them with the milking cows and they'll come, I, I guarantee you. The only heifers after a few days, it's hardship for a few days, but after a few days, the only heifers that'll ever be in the connecting yard are the ones the bullet. The okay, rest so of them it's really back. interesting, guys, yeah. because all of these slightly different systems, right? But the one thing I think for anyone listening to it is, there's lots of ways of skinning, yeah. skinning this cat. And a lot of people get, oh my God, I have to synchronize him. Oh my God, I have to do this, whatever. But there's actually, you can really make the suit your system. Is, is, is well, the reality, right? like, all I would say is we have them on an out farm now. It's very handy if you had them at home. We used to have them at home until home got maximized, right? So they're on an out farm. And that's not stopping me, you know. So that's the bottom line. It's yeah, not well, stopping, and it's not stopping me getting yeah. a successful conception rate. And so there's ways and means of getting the heifers in calf. And if, for me, whether you do, Fixed time AI, whether you inject them after seven, eight, nine days, whatever you do, if, or you go the full 20 days to get, or 21 days, whatever it is. If that length of time is not worth the investment in the long run, I don't know what you're doing in your business to make the thing work better and make more money. Okay. We're, we're going to change gear a little bit, right? We're going to think about the cows we're not going to breed replacements from, and what are we going to do with those? Uh, George, you might give a bit of an, a helicopter view of the dairy beef index, how we're looking at in terms of getting the value calf. Okay, so the bottom line in the dairy beef index is the higher the, the DBI, the more profit that calf will generate for the dairy farmer and from the beef farmer. We split it down the middle, half it's valued around gestation length and calving interval, the other half is around confirmation and beef carcass, carcass value. So from a dairy farmer's perspective, we're looking for re reasonably easy calving and, and good gestation length. We've got to tailor it to the cow we're putting it on. So mature cows, maybe we look a little bit, we can be more uh, relaxed about the calving uh, difficulty piece. We're looking for reliability though for both the younger cows and for the older cows as well. So very, so you're really looking at this DBI index, uh, you're looking at the panel of beef bulls available to you. You're looking at the calving ease, negative on gestation length, we're looking at a positive and carcass weight in there, yeah. and we're looking for high reliability behind the calving difficulty figure. That's kind of a, a very short sum. And unlike, the, unlike maybe the, the dairy side of the house, you probably don't need to use a massive team of bulls. Two, two, codes for two or three is probably enough for most, most of us keeping our heads at any one time when we're selecting the bulls. Okay, Owen, are, 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 how are you handling the beef side? Yeah, yeah, we're exactly the same. I, I guess we, ha we have a mop-up um, Hereford bull that, that runs, but he, he, we wouldn't work him until we're six weeks into breeding. So for yep. the first six weeks, everything is AI because the numbers <laughs> are too big. So what we do is the bulls, the cows that are selected out for different reasons that are to get beef, they're on the, they're on the, the Dairy Beef um, Gene Ireland program. We get two Hereford bulls and we get one Angus bull. Um, what we do with them then, they're all AI with them. Any second calver or an older cow, we'll put the Angus on. So we're eliminating the calving risk that is associated with using the, the dairy the beef test index, bulls. the yeah, test bulls. Test bulls okay. And the rest of them then, we'll get, we'll get the Herefords. The one thing we have found with them, um, uh, them bulls is the calving, uh, the calving interval is very short. They'll, calve, they'll put out calves to you two weeks before and, and they're fine calves like that. Now, from our own farm point of view, we have uh, a farmer, a beef farmer that buys all of our um, bull calves off the farm, all of our beef bull calves, and he'll buy maybe 10 to 15 of our Frisian bull calves off the farm. So we want to keep him. He's not going to stay with us if we're going to have poor quality beef calves on the farm. Um, the rest of the beef calves then are carried through to three to four weeks of age, and we sell them in the local market okay. in Milton. Okay. Similar, I think, might yourself. You're using Gene Ireland. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm a supporter of the Gene Te Ireland. Dairy, 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 yeah, and, dairy and, and I find yeah. as year as time goes on, the quality calves are getting better and better and better. Like they're smashing yeah. calves. Now it's all Angus I use, and I'd use a, a very similar strategy as well. That if she was a handy size second lactation animal, I wouldn't take the risk on her. I'd use one of the proven bulls that the, the lads here in Munster have. 
uh, or progressive have, and I choose one of those proven ones that I know. So I'd always, outside of the, the, the Gene Ireland program, I'd always have one other Angus bull in the tank, okay. that just to be sure, it's already proven, like that, that George was talking about. That's very and it important. Ticks all, it ticks yeah. all the boxes. So yeah. just, you know, if she's a handy little one, and she's still growing, you know what I mean? She's still growing away from first, second yeah. lactation. You have to give her a chance. So that's the only, that's the only fine point. Okay, so it's a real key point there for, for, for people listening. You know, again, it's managing risk. We have a highly reliable calve and difficulty that we can see in those bulls in the panel. Like I, I do six, sorry, I just, yeah, I, yeah, I do, Michael, yeah. we do uh, nine weeks of AI. I do, I do about 23, 24 days of Frisian, and then it's all Angus after that. So I pretty much cover the whole season. I, I, I season. you know, I cover the whole, yeah. the mop pull. You see, it wouldn't get much work now, yeah. like Same guys. for you, Robert, I think, is it? Yeah, I'm all AI, like, I'm all AI, and I'd have to say, from listening to this, the one thing that I'd stress is the calving ease for those bulls is vital, because they're the later cows, yeah. this calving, they're the ones you want to go back in calf quick. Yes. Like, so if you put a wrong beef bull into those cows, you're right in the, uh, your the exit, you're showing them the exit door, really. The, okay. if they have a, like okay. I said, it, I said it on the interview there. Like when I got, I have been down. I have a hundred cows calved. I've been in the yard in the middle of the night four times having a hundred mm -hmm. cows. Mm -hmm. That's the standard I set. Like. Mm -hmm. Okay, or else you're just inclined over to stay in bed. You know, I can I can support Good on you. I can support Robert. Said. And I, I bench my ear. And like, sorry, I bench my ear. And how many times do I have to get out of bed in the night time? Really? Yes, okay. I'm, I'm down to two times on average over the last six, seven years. <laughs> Yeah, and the one thing I, I, I suppose, look, I started off in veterinary in the 90s, sections were, were what we did, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a big thing. I, I think the one thing that started out a huge amount of calving difficulty has, be, has been the breeding piece. Mm -hmm. Last word on, on DBI, Seamus. Yeah, look, at it's, it's, uh, it's something I think as an industry, as a dairy industry, we're going to have to take more uh, responsibility for, and, and not even from a, self, uh, from a selfish point of view, because we, we, we need to be fairly confident that we're going to have a market for higher genetic merit calves as time goes on and there's more beef comes out of the dairy herd and the, the good news is that there's really and I think the lads have, have testified to this there's really good Angus and Hereford bulls in, uh, in NCBC um, presently now the one thing I would say is just in terms of gestation length like uh, the difference between using maybe a, 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 a Hereford or a limousine bull stock bull on your herd versus a very short gestation bull like you're talking about on it could be two to three weeks now that's two to three weeks milk but that's a lot of money. There's a lot of money in that. And there's that lull right at the moment. I think a lot of people are in this yeah. lull because the stock bull has come in. We, uh, we might have continued AIing, but also where gestation length is actually, you know, is creeping. Mm -hmm. So look, I, I mean, I think in general, the, 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 what I'm taking from, from, from the DVI is use the reliability on the calving difficulty. If you're worried, make sure it's all proven. If you're looking at Gene Ireland, be careful about your, your, your cow selection there and encourage everybody in dairy, encourage for positive carcass. Exactly. In, in the, so that we give benefit to that beef farmer exactly. and the return customer. Guys, we've talked about an awful lot here. Uh, what I'm going to say, I want to thank you all. Uh, it's been a super discussion. There's loads of stuff we haven't talked about. We'll pick up the discussion on sex and so on in the second panel. Uh, I just want to thank, thank you all for, for me, from everybody here, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.